everyone. Uh, today, I'm going to take you through Agronomics, uh, which is a leading listed investor in the field of uh, cellular agriculture with a focus on cultivated uh, meats and alternative proteins. We are targeting uh, a portfolio of companies uh, with defensible intellectual property uh, with the potential to produce a step change in the efficiency of production of products that are traditionally derived from animals. That includes uh, dairy proteins, it includes materials such as leather, um, but uh, most importantly, that also includes uh, meat, which uh, as we'll get to, uh, is causing a huge amount of environmental damage. This is a sector that is supported by a number of fundamental secular trends. It covers sustainability, climate change, animal welfare, human health, uh, and even has a role to play in the prevention of future pandemics. Now, we have a market cap of around uh, 30 million pounds, uh, having launched about 18 months ago. And the reason that we've been able to achieve, achieve so much in a relatively short period of time is largely due to the uh, uh, caliber of our board. We are led by Richard Reed, uh, who is a very well-known entrepreneur uh, turned investor. Uh, he's best known for his success, having founded Innocent Drinks with his two co-founders and then went on to sell that to Coca-Cola for a very large sum of money. Subsequent to that, he has gone on to form a venture capital firm, Cham Jar Investments, focused on consumer brands and has made a number of um, successful and high profile uh, investments there. And then Jim Mellon, uh, a non-executive director and largest shareholder that you're likely aware of. Jim has uh, made a name for himself and made a vast amount of wealth by identifying uh, emerging fundamental trends before they become mainstream. Uh, he started off in emerging markets in the late 80s, early 90s, rotated into natural resources. He wrote a book about the financial crisis and why it was going to happen. Uh, he wrote that in 2005 and the rest is history. Uh, and I have been working with Jim for about uh, 13, coming up to 14 years now, uh, primarily focused on early stage direct investments in the field of biotech. I am a charter financial analyst by training um, and have been involved uh, with Jim for 13 years, as I said, uh, and I am supported by Laura Turner, who is uh, a relatively recent graduate from Oxford, having done her uh, master's at UC Berkeley in recombinant proteins and cell culture, which has particular relevance for this field. Now, everyone understands that the global population is rising, but something that is underappreciated is that consumption of meat is uh, not growing in a linear fashion with this population growth. In the US, over the past 50 years or so, you've had an increase in per capita consumption of uh, meat by about 30%. But it's in China, and this trend is reflected across other emerging markets uh, where the real damage has been done. Uh, we've seen, witnessed a, uh, something like a 16-fold increase in per capita consumption uh, in China, and that has caused animal husbandry to become the largest single contributor to uh, climate change or greenhouse gas emissions uh, and a big contributor to climate change. So. 18% of all greenhouse gas emissions come from animal husbandry. That's more than all forms of transport combined. 50% uh, uh, of all water that goes into, uh, that humans use goes into animal husbandry. And that includes the water that goes to water the crops that are then subsequently uh, fed to animals. Uh, in fact, 70% of all crops which we grow are not for direct human consumption. They go to animal feed and the reason that that percentage is so high is because animals are inherently very inefficient at converting calories of feed into calories of uh, animal flesh. Uh, the chicken is the most broadly consumed, uh, uh, highly efficient animal that has a conversion ratio of nine to one, but a cow is more like 25 to one. So if everyone went vegetarian tomorrow, then it wouldn't be a problem feeding the world's population and growing population. Uh, but of course, that is not going to happen. In addition to those statistics, you have 80 billion animals killed each year and 2 trillion fish, and perversely, most of those fish actually go uh, get ground up and fed to other fish. 
Uh, and then something that we are now all acutely aware of um, is uh, zoonotic disease and the potential for pandemics. 80% of all antibiotics which are made go into animal husbandry. And that's because these animals are kept in intensive farms in, in very close quarters. So they have to be continually dosed to prevent them from getting sick. Now, today we have, uh, we're living through a viral pandemic, but if we were to have a bacterial pandemic uh, where antibiotics were, um, did not work, then we would have something that could potentially look more like uh, the Black Death, and in that single event, one third of the world's population was wiped out. So that is a pretty scary prospect indeed, and something that I think until this pandemic, very few people uh, had uh, had considered. Um, because so much uh, uh, feed is required for these animals, you have vast amounts of land committed to growing that feed. And um, if the US alone were to produce all of its protein, in this manner, then it should free up about 600 million acres of land, which could be used for other productive purposes, housing, etc., or indeed reforestation uh, for carbon sequestration. So in response to uh, the growing awareness around the environmental impacts of meat consumption, you have this rise in conscious consumption, which in many respects has been driven by uh, the younger cohorts, Gen Z and millennials, uh, you know, you have record numbers of vegans and vegetarians in those age cohorts, but um, the reality is that that's still not a large enough percentage of people to make a dent on the environmental impact, impact um, of animal husbandry. So we need to look to solutions which um, make it easier for consumers to switch. We've already seen the rise of uh, plant-based proteins, uh, in particular impossible foods and beyond meat, are flying the flag there. I think a lot of attention was drawn to this sector with Beyond Meat's hugely successful uh, IPO, now a $8 billion company. Um, and it should be noted that these uh, the revenues in the plant-based proteins are forecast to grow to about 14, uh, about, about $40 billion um, by 2025. And that's from a very, very low base. But what we are particularly interested in is cellular agriculture. This is a, uh, a direct one-for-one -one substitution rather than just trying to mimic the sensory profile of meat using plant-based proteins, growing real meat in bioreactors uh, to, um, to produce the fat and the, and the, the muscle cells um, that are uh, currently enjoyed by consumers. Now, AT Carney, a global consultancy uh, forecasts that cultivated meat will represent about 35% of this market by 3035. And you can see that uh, the Good Food Institute here did a survey of 3000 people from the US, China and India. And although none of these products are on the market, the cultivated meat products are on the market yet, um, the indications are very much that uh, the take up or the inclination to trial by these products uh, is in line with the plant-based proteins. Uh, some of you may have uh, may remember that in 2013, the first uh, cultivated beef burger was produced by Professor Mark Post uh, of Maastricht University. Um, that was funded by uh, Sergey Brin, co-founder of Google, because it cost 250,000 euros to produce. Uh, it was served live um, on BBC here in London, uh, and that really was the um, the starting point. For this industry but it wasn't until 2016 when that research project was uh, spun out into a commercial enterprise uh, and today these uh, the, the sector has grown to be about 60 companies strong but that being said in the five years since 2016 that first company was spun out only about 400 million dollars has gone into the sector and about 60 percent of that has gone into the sector in this year alone and we have line of sight on a, a significant number of uh, fu funding rounds, which is gonna um, increase that uh, amount of capital further. You have very significant uh, institutional investors starting to uh, play in this field. Um, Tomasek and SoftBank, they co-led the round of Memphis Meats, uh, which is the leading beef company uh, in the US. And they paid quite a, uh, a high price for that, uh, a rumored $450 million pre-money valuation 
raising $161 million. But the point here, you can see in this chart that um, the capital is very much starting to flow and some very large sophisticated investors are, uh, uh, are moving into the sector and valuations are certainly starting to creep up too. Now, Perfect Day, although not um, specifically in meat, it's a, a dairy company, uh, although we don't know the valuation there, their last funding round was uh, $300 million. Uh, so I very much expect that that's a unicorn. And then you have just the combination uh, plant-based egg uh, company as uh, it is also working on cultivated chicken and it raised money at a $1.1 billion valuation uh, quite recently. So agronomics portfolio currently consists of 14 companies. And when we set out to construct this portfolio, we wanted to cover off all the key protein categories, uh, as well as all the key and credible technology approaches to producing meat um, or seafood or materials in this fashion. So we have a seafood, we have beef, we have pork, we have a novel protein coming from solar foods. We have plant-based proteins um, in the company Live Kindly. Uh, we have materials, uh, leather being produced by Vitro Labs. Legendary is producing dairy. And then we have some smaller earlier stage opportunities like Shiok working on uh, prawns um, and even uh, cultivated cotton. Um, in this portfolio, we have about 10% cash remaining following our recent uh, 10 million pound fundraise, uh, which allowed us to uh, make our follow on investment in Blue Nalu. And we have a pipeline of investments where this is going to be deployed relatively quickly. Um, but we have a number of uh, pretty significant uh, funding rounds anticipated uh, in the underlying portfolio companies in the relatively near future and we will not be looking to raise money again until those have been reflected in the net asset value but we expect to see very significant appreciation uh, in the portfolio and our underlying holdings in the relatively near term. So agronomics is a leading investor in a field which you can otherwise not get exposure to by any other means. Uh, we have an established portfolio of companies um, which are definitely leaders in their field. Um, this is a sector which has every zeitgeist of today that you could possibly want. As I said, climate change, sustainability, animal welfare, welfare and human health. Uh, and we have deep domain expertise in what is a highly technical field. Uh, and fundamentally, this is a bet on the rising tide of the field of cellular agriculture. Thank you.